for the sake of visitors, just briefly, I believe that the book of Revelation, though the end of it is about the final return of Jesus bodily to make a new heavens and new earth and resurrect us from the dead, and that has not happened yet, I believe that the book of Revelation that was written before 70 AD and is very much the majority of it is about the vindication of Jesus and his people through God bringing the Roman armies in to judge Israel and Jerusalem and destroy the temple. Because Jesus had cried out, it is finished. Christians had trusted it is, it is finished. And the institutional false religion of unbelieving Judaism, this is not being anti-Semitic, it's written by a Jew. John was Jewish, okay? Uh, the institutional enslaving false religion of a Christ-rejecting Judaism that continued to kill these animals after the true Lamb of God had already been slain once for our sins. They were preaching a false gospel and persecuting God's people, and God was bringing justice on their head by using the most powerful government on the face of the earth at that time as pawns in the hands of King Jesus to accomplish his justice, his earthly justice against the persecutors of his people. See? So the, here is the mystery, okay? If you look at redemptive history, Israel was the people of God, and like Egypt, they were enemies of God's people, right? The, the Israelites were enslaved for 400 years, over 400 years in Egypt. Uh, Sodom, they're, they don't fare well under God's justice, not only for their certain forms of sexual immorality, but I think also for sexual abuse of one another, uh, violence towards one another as well. God judged Sodom. Uh, Babylon is the famous enemy of the people of God who took them away captive, see? And what we find is this great mystery is that Revelation, now it's an unveiling, you wouldn't find this on your own, you wouldn't see this on your own, that in rejecting God in the flesh and persecuting the true people of God, Jerusalem had become Sodom. It says that in Revelation 11. That great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. It is spiritually called Egypt. The, the people of God had become the enemies of God because they rejected God when He showed up and lived among them. Mm -hmm. See? And persecuted His people. But Jerusalem had become Babylon. Like the chief enemy of the people of God. That place where they were enslaved, you know, where they were sent off to Babylon, is the place of bondage, the place of slavery, the place of humiliation, the place of destruction for them. Jerusalem had become Babylon, and that's what we see here. Now, how does that preach the gospel to us? If Jerusalem, who persecuted Christians, had become Egypt and Babylon, then, then those who trust in Jesus are the true people of God because what? It is finished. That's not the end of my sermon. You're like, oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> that, was like, that was the shortest sermon you've ever preached. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. That if, if you see that Jerusalem had become Babylon, therefore Christians are the new Jerusalem, and, that, and it really is finished. Jesus is vindicating the gospel to his people through wielding the Roman armies to bring justice on unrepentant Israel for their sins against Christ and against his people. And this is not being anti-Semitic. It's not. So let's look briefly at, at these things. What we see is that God in this passage was about to pour his wrath out on Jerusalem and Rome through earthly judgments to vindicate his son and his people. This is all about the gospel. This is all about that chattery voice in your head every day that says, no, it's not finished. Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection are not sufficient. You have to get a better job. You have to be a better mom. You have to get better grades. You have to succeed more in life, whatever that looks like, or you're not really justified. You're not really okay. You're not really worthy of my full love. See? We unfortunately preach a false gospel, and some not in, a, not in a damning way, but we preach a false gospel sometimes to each other in the way we treat each other. And that's one of the things we were repenting for in the resolution that I read. Yeah, I'm glad you believe in Jesus, but yeah, you'll never really be fully a part of the life of this church because you blah, blah, blah. See how that's a false gospel? That's just like saying, 
You know, yeah, you became Christian, but if you really want to be children of God, you have to be circumcised. Paul says that is a false gospel. And he says, if I or an angel from heaven come to you preaching any other gospel than what I preach, let him be anathema, which means literally, sorry kids, God damn me if I preach to you a false gospel. That's literally what he's saying. This is serious, but this is good news. Yes, it's about wrath poured out. It's about satisfied justice against evil. The justice that we deserve on our own head. The justice that Jesus took in our place. And took in the place of all who will simply call on him and respond to his offer of free forgiveness and eternal life through faith in him. So let's look briefly at these bowls of wrath. First bowl. Well, last week we saw the, the, the temple in heaven being filled with the smoke and glory of God as he rose up in his anger and sent out these angels to carry out his will and actually pour the wrath out on the city. And so here we have the action. That was the preparation and the, and the songs of victory and the, yes, okay, finally, after the crying out, how long, O Lord, do you avenge our blood on those who killed us and persecuted us? God's saying, here it is. It's coming here, and we get to see this image of what would happen a few years from when this was written. This was written during the, during the empire, during the reign of Nero. So this is a few years before it actually happened. We get this image of the wrath no longer swilling in the, in the bowl, but actually coming out of the bowl onto their heads in justice. So look at the first bowl. Verse 2, so the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. The word for, in Greek for earth is also rightly and I think appropriately here translated land. It's talking about the land of Israel. It's not cosmos, like the whole world. It's the land. The first uh, went and, and poured out his bowl upon the land or the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. I believe those who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image were those who did whatever the Roman Empire required to show allegiance to Nero Caesar of the day. And you were forbidden from participating in economic activity if you didn't like throw some incense in to the little thing for the emperor. We saw that throughout uh, Acts and, and throughout this letter, uh, this revelation. And so the, the people who had aligned themselves with Nero, Nero's name, Nero Kazar in Hebrew, adds up to 666. So this may kind of rock your world, but I believe that the 666 is actually referring to Nero Caesar. It says, let, let him calculate the name. It is the name of a man, and that's how it worked. Letters had numerical equivalents. So you can listen to earlier sermons if you want more information about that. So what's the significance of the boils? Now, I don't, I don't know any like um, historical account that says, yeah, so everyone got boils, literally. Like Some of these things, I think, are symbolic. Some of them were fulfilled more literally. But what did Bobby read earlier? The, the, the plagues on Egypt. The word plagues is used here in, the, in this section of Scripture to talk about these judgments on Israel. Again, who had become Egypt, right? Who had enslaved God's people through legalistic, binding, enslaving, false religion. Jesus came as the new Moses to set his people free, both Jew and Gentile, you see? So, uh, I want to read to you Deuteronomy 28, verse 27 and 35. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Just, um, Deuteronomy 28, because I want you to see the connection here. In Deuteronomy, it's before they enter the land of Israel, after wandering around for years and years in the in, 40 years in the wilderness, God is, is predicting and warning them that he knows that his people are going to rebel against them and, and he's going to have to judge them. Ultimately, in the way that we see in Revelation chapter 16, that's where it's fulfilled. But listen to what he says, Deuteronomy 28, 27, and 35. Keep in mind, this is the people of Israel. It's like the next generation of the people who had been set free from slavery in Egypt. Enslaved 400 years, okay? So Deuteronomy 28, 27, and then 35 says this. The Lord, is talking to Israel, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt. See that? With tumors, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. And then 35 
says, The Lord will strike you in the knees and in the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed, and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. This is the judgment on Jerusalem as the tr spiritual Egypt. This is one of those plagues, the boils. Now the second bowl. See, turn to, the, to blood of a dead man. Look back at Revelation 16. I think that's important. It's not just turn to blood. Look at verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, um, you know, you can pour out the, the blood of a living man. I'm, this is, you're like, wow, we got up for this. This is really interesting. I can't wait to eat lunch after church today. This is like a CSI episode in church. We're doing forensic uh, Bible study, right? The blood of a living man, you know, you can swill around in a glass, right? I don't want to know all the details of Tim working on cadavers and stuff. Uh, the blood of a dead man, it's not like that. It gets funky, right? It gets stanky. It gets make you throw up if you smell it. And that's what this is talking about. Thanks. Is that my right? Thank you. Yes. Thanks. No spot up. Real. Preach it, Pastor. All right. Preach that blood. All right, um, so here's the account of Josephus, a, Jew a Jewish historian at the time, who described the, uh, the judgment on Jerusalem, what was happening uh, as he recorded it. One could see the whole lake, and this, is, this lake is the Sea of Galilee. This is fascinating. One could see the whole lake stained with blood and crammed with corpses, for not a man escaped. You know, they tried to flee from the Romans and got slayed in the, in the water on their little feeble boats they were trying to get away from them. During the days that followed, a horrible stench hung over the region, and it presented an equally horrifying spectacle. The beaches were strewn with wrecks and swollen bodies, which, hot and clammy with decay, and that's a poetic imagery, right? hot and clammy with decay, made the air so foul that the catastrophe that plunged the Jews in mourning revolted even those who had brought it about. Boom. The blood as of a dead man. The sea was turned to the blood as of a dead man. Now, the third bowl, which more closely resembles the plagues on Egypt, is this. Look, look at verse three, uh, verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Sound familiar? The, the rivers, like, oh, I don't know, maybe the Nile River back in Egypt, right? Turned into blood. Uh, the what, like, what was so amazing about the miracles in Egypt was, you know, if you had water in a bowl, like God turned that to blood too. It wasn't just like, oh, here's some bloody water over here, but everything else is clean. He turned all the water to blood. And you know, we think about that from a distance, like, yeah, yeah, the plagues from under blood. Like, how long can you go without water? And they didn't have cokes and sprite back then, right? How long can you go without water? How long can you live as a vampire drinking human blood? Right? This was judgment. This was judgment. And it directly resembled the plagues on Egypt. Um, I want you to look back at Deuteronomy 28 again. Because I want you to see the context that God had promised ahead of time, way back in... Uh, welcome, kids. Way back when, He had promised this judgment to Israel. Deuteronomy 28, 53-57. Kids, you're going to hear some fun stuff in a few minutes. <laughs> Y'all can, uh, can have a decompressed conversation over lunch. Alright, Deuteronomy 28, 53-57. It's kind of like we're celebrating Halloween early, like vampires and stuff like that. Sorry, don't, don't be offended. Deuteronomy 28, 53 and 57. It says, this is, this is rough. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate strait in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left 
and the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at your gates, the tender and delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter. Her, this is rough. Her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her shoulder which she bears. For she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. I joke, but this is horrible. This is horrible. And this is what the Bible is talking about. That the abusers and oppressors and torturers and murderers of the people of God were going to have this come on their heads. And there are horrible accounts of the Roman Empire, of the destruction of Jerusalem, in which people actually ate their own children. David Chilton says this, and by the way, I'm drawing so much of this, I kind of want to get a, give a shout out, even though he's dead now. Uh, David Chilton, his commentary, Days of Vengeance, I don't want to plagiarize. Like, I'm getting, I'm getting this from him, okay? And on our Facebook group for our church, I posted a link. You can just Google Days of Vengeance, Dave, Dave, uh, David Chilton, and you can get a free PDF, a free file of the whole commentary. And I would highly commend it to you. But here's a quote from him. As God had foretold through Moses, as we just read, during the siege of Jerusalem, the Israelites actually became cannibals. Mothers literally ate their own children because they shed the blood of the saints. God gives them their own blood to drink. It's horrific. But this is just a picture of evil and what evil deserves. Okay? So the fourth bowl, moving on. Scorching heat. Verse... Uh, By the way, in verses 4 and 5, when they start singing that thing, you are, they were saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, which is their due. Um, this stuff and the stuff that we read last week about the Song of Moses, I learned this week, was part of, the Israel, of Israel's liturgy. Where between the time when they had prepared the sacrifice and the time when they were going to offer up the sacrifice and pour out the blood, they would sing this kind of stuff. And so what we see is Israel's own liturgy used against her in judgment in this passage. That we see. So now, um, verse eight, and I just want to say that this is this shows us how how our moral meters are so off because we're thinking how could this possibly adjust judgment. And God graciously in verse 7 says, And I heard another, or John says, I heard another uh, from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. We take that by faith. We can't see evil the way God sees evil. And we're like, that's harsh. It's like, no, it's not. We are, are dulled toward the evilness of evil and the goodness of good. Because we are evil, right? Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So, the way you feel about the horrors that you just heard, some of it is right the way you feel, some of it is not because we are sinful. And so, so we have to take God's justice on faith. That e the evil that the people who are enduring this horror had done was far more evil than we can possibly imagine to God. He's so good and we're not. So that's just a pastoral note for you. So verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now what's this talking about? First, symbolically, blessing from God was often pictured as being a shelter or a shade from the scorching heat of the sun. It's, it's all throughout the Bible. Like, he's the shade at your right hand. He's the rock of refuge. You know, you're in a desert. You get under a rock. You're like, whoo! There may even be a spring nearby, right? God refreshes his people. This is blessing, right? So this scorching heat of the sun is the reverse of blessing. It's curse. Now what happened to people in Jerusalem? There was a lot of fire. The city was burned with fire. So that may be more of the literal fulfillment of this. But the point is this, this, this opposite of blessing, this unshieldedness from the scorching heat of the sun. 
And notice that just like in Egypt, these plagues did not lead to repentance for Pharaoh. You know, they didn't lead to repentance. They didn't repent. Verse 10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. In the Bible, there is a very strong connection between Israel and Jerusalem particularly, and Rome and the Roman Empire and the, and the emperor of Rome. The people in Israel had aligned themselves with the beast Nero and had given in to emperor worship. When Jesus was going to be crucified, they said, we have no king but Caesar. You're like Pilate said, behold your king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. You see? And so when it says on the throne of the beast, the throne of Nero, it could be talking about his, his sway over the people of Israel in Jerusalem. It doesn't have to be on Rome. But either way, when you look at what happened in this era, the, uh, Nero's line of emperors and what happened in Rome itself when Nero, after Nero killed himself in 68 AD, it was unbelievable. You can look it up in history. For the sake of time, I'm not going to, win, going to go into it. But it was a judgment on Rome as well. It was horrible what happened in the city. All the killing and bloodshed and unrest. So God was going to judge. So Nero doesn't get away scot-free. you know, And Rome doesn't get away scot-free. And the, those aligning themselves with Rome in Jerusalem would not get ahead scot-free. God was pouring darkness, judging on them. So, uh, now let's look at the sixth bowl. Verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the devil, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming. I'll get to that in a second. So here you have um, the, way, the way made way geographically for the enemies to come in and judge Israel and the way made spiritually, like false spirits stirring people up in deception to come and attack Israel to attack them. And I want to read this to you um, from David Shelton. The image of the drawing of the Euphrates for a conquering army is taken in part from a stratagem of Cyrus the Persian who conquered Babylon by temporarily turning the Euphrates out of its course, enabling his army to march up the riverbed into the city, taking it by surprise. So isn't that interesting? So that you've got imagery of the judgment on Egypt in here, all the plagues and stuff, but you also have imagery of judgment on Babylon. You see? Jerusalem had become Babylon. The way for the invaders was made, and it's open. They're vulnerable, and they're actually, their enemies are being inflamed and stirred up by demonic activity to get them all riled up to come in and wipe them out. So the seventh bowl, look at, keep looking, oh, so... We pause. Verse 15, look at this curious insertion of Jesus' is directly saying, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. What we see here is, I don't believe Jesus is talking about his second coming, his final coming, and his return here. What I believe Jesus is doing is saying that behind Nero Caesar, or you know, or the new one, the Pacian of the Kim or whoever was after him, behind the Roman Empire and their forces coming to set fire to the city of Jerusalem and destroy her temple. Mm -hmm. Behind all that is the risen King Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and who's, in whose hand are the hearts of the kings of the earth, and he turns them like a water course wherever he wishes, blamelessly. King Jesus was wielding the Roman army by his sovereign power and bringing them to bring the judgment that was due the oppressors of God's people. So Jesus saying, I am coming quickly. You think it's Rome, but I'm behind it. And I'm wielding it to bring the justice on your heads that you deserve. Wow. It's a different view of history, isn't it? Right? History is God's literature. Amen. It's the seventh pole, fall of Jerusalem and other cities. 
Look with me. Verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done! And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city, that's Jerusalem, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, or Gentiles fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So I'm going to read this to you from Josephus about, well, actually, sorry. The, at the, in Ezekiel 5.12, I won't go there, God gives a prophecy about the first judgment on Jerusalem at the hand of the Babylonians that was going to happen in 580 whatever BC. Uh, God gave Ezekiel this command to take this hair and divide it into threes and do these different things to it. And he said, you know, a third of you are going to die by the sword. A third of you are going to die by this. A third of you are going to die by that. Dividing the city into three for judgment comes straight out of Ezekiel, which we've talked about before. is like the Old Testament revelation. There's so many parallels. And Ezekiel was a lot about the destruction of Jerusalem the first time, you see? So, so you've got that division um, notice that the great city is distinguished from the cities of the Gentiles. If the great city were Rome, if Babylon were Rome, you know, that wouldn't make sense because, I don't know, Rome's kind of a Gentile city, right? And so again, this shows that the great city is a Jewish city. It's Jerusalem, okay? So, and then you've got this hail. Now the great city, uh, verse 20, that every island fled away and the mountains were not found and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. It's interesting, again, plague, plague, plague. Since that plague was exceedingly great, straight out of Egypt, right? The, the plague of hail, as Bobby read earlier, hail, it's going back to Egypt again, all the enemies of God's people. And so I want you to also see how this was literally fulfilled. The Roman army had stones, catapult stones, that weighed a ton. And they were white stones. I want to read this to you from Josephus. The stone missiles weighed a talent and traveled two furlongs or more, and their impact not only on those who were hit first, but also on those behind them was enormous. At first the Jews kept watch for the stone, for it was white, and its approach was intimated to the eye by its shining surface as well as to the ear by its whizzing sound. What does that look like? Hail, right? A big white stone flying through the air that weighs a talent? You see how this was literally fulfilled? Watchmen posted on the towers gave the warnings whenever the engine was fired, and the stone came hurtling toward them, shouting in their native tongue, The sun is coming, S-O-N. The sun is coming. Now they either thought that it was Jesus coming, like he said he was going to come in judgment, or they were mocking Christians, like, oh, the sun's coming. I don't know. But that's what they said. Those in the line of fire made way and fell prone, a precaution that resulted in the stones passing harmlessly through, the fall, through and falling in their rear. To frustrate this, it occurred to the Romans to blacken the stones so that they could not be seen so easily beforehand. Then they hit their target and destroyed many with a single shot. Smart Romans, right? But there were these thousand pound stones flying through the air and crushing the enemies of God. So, what do you do with all this? This is wrath poured out. I deserve the wrath spoken of here no less than the people upon whom it fell. Right? And it's the same with you. Because God is good, wrath has to be poured out. He can't just uh, postpone justice and patience forever, or he would be an evil judge. If crime goes unpunished, God would be an evil judge. <coughs> But my, my sin deserves more than getting crushed by a thousand ton stone. My sin deserves eternal torment. Right? So these pictures of earthly justice are but a type or a foretaste of the final judgment that will come. Here you have the bowls being actually poured out. You know, it's like if you warn your child, like, if you do this, this is going to happen. 
If you do this, this is going to happen. If you do this, this is going to happen. Months and months months go by and it never happens. That's not really good parenting. That's not just being patient. That's not being faithful, right? Now, I know there's a difference between discipline and justice, but you understand. The wrath was going to have to come, and it did. But there is a future wrath that's coming for all of those who continue to reject God's Son. If God gave His only Son so that He could freely offer you eternal life and adopt you in His family, and all you had to do is say, yes, I'm a sinner, and yes, I want you. Jesus, I'm yours. You are good in my place. You took my bad. You died on the cross. You rose from the dead. You're my only hope. To reject that, the wrath, the wrath has to be poured to hell, right? So we escape the wrath poured out on the world through faith in the wrath poured out of yeah. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That means that those of you in this room who are trusting in Jesus, the wrath has already been poured out. It is finished, right? Yeah. But those who reject Jesus are like, no, I'll just, I'll just take the shot myself. Please don't do that. Please don't. I beg of you, don't do that. Take him at his word. Again, we see that if Jerusalem become Babylon and Egypt, then Jesus really was telling the truth. That that voice in your head throughout the week, like, you're not good enough, you're a failure, you're screwed up, whatever, you know, you're not okay, you're not okay, you're not okay, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. That voice in your head will, be, will cease as you embrace further the truth that what? It is finished. 